right, so I just watched chapter 11 of The Mandalorian, The Heiress, and there's a lot in there. So let's talk about it. Hi, my name is Sean, and I love to talk about movies and nerdy stuff way too much. If you can relate, you're probably in the right place. Consider clicking that subscribe button. With that in mind, go ahead and join me down below in the comment section. What did you think about this latest episode of The Mandalorian and all of the nice little nuggets that were in there? This will be a spoiler review for the most part. But for the first few minutes, I'll give my general impressions without spoilers, and then I'll just kind of walk through my thoughts on everything that happened afterwards. But with that in mind, you can spoil away down below in the comment sections, and there's a lot of stuff to talk about in this one, so I'm looking for a nice fun discussion with you down there and maybe you can fill in some gaps where you have more knowledge on some of these characters than I have. With that said, let's go into my general impressions of the episode and I, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. It was, it was a solid episode of The Mandalorian and did what I've wanted this season to do thus far, especially a huge improvement over last week, which if you heard my review, definitely frustrated me. And then it also kind of gave uh, gave me the hints, the teases as to the trajectory of the season, whereas episode one, which I thoroughly enjoyed, or I guess chapter nine, which I thoroughly enjoyed, it was more of a, like a standalone story that I found interesting, but it didn't really let you know where the season was headed. This one filled in some of those gaps a little bit more and you felt like you actually made progress on the quest and understood how some of these side characters we're meeting will tie into the grander narrative based off the information that we had before. So this is the one that kind of gave me really what I was needing for this season to get a better hold of where we're headed, how it will all tie together. And uh, it had some cool action. Of course, it has some fantastic ties back to the Star Wars lore and plenty to talk about there. And with that said, um, if you haven't seen the episode, go watch the episode and then I'm going to walk through what happened right here. So, all right, from there, let's just kind of walk through the episode. It kicks off with the Razor's Crest just kind of wobbling through space. This shot was in some of the trailers before. I actually kind of assumed this would be the first shot of this episode based off where the last one ended. And of my predictions while doing this YouTube thing, it's one of the few times I was actually correct. But so kind of wobbles in and as it goes into the atmosphere of this planet, the ship is shot, and so they basically start just crash landing down towards the water and just at the last second catch themselves. And then as they're trying to land, it's still wobbly. It is there's a nice little gag where it just like tips over on its side. One of the Akbar fish people just kind of like shakes his head. Great little Mandalorian joke. So as they arrive there. Mando starts asking around, trying to figure out his path that he should head on to try and find these Mandalorians that are supposedly on this planet. Our frog people send him on the right direction. He meets someone that lines him up with these people that say that they can take him on a ship to where the Mandalorians are at. And so they load up on the ship. It's interesting because it, it's like an actual ship floating on water, which normally in Star Wars world, people things float and the tech is a little bit more high tech than what we have. So it's floating right along and there's a little creature on board that needs to be fed. So they open up the bay doors and you have this little sequence where walk over to start feeding it and then the creatures kick baby Yoda into this pit and the pit <laughs> they just eats baby Yoda. And then they push Mr. Mando in as well to try and get his armor, which at this point, the moment in time, you get a couple, two questions coming to mind. First, first one on here is, uh, uh, why is Mando so dumb or why do they keep writing him so dumb that we're in a universe where, you know, Everywhere you go, it's dangerous. Everybody wants to steal his armor. I know everybody wants to steal his armor and it's very valuable and nobody could be trusted. I have watched just throughout the course of his life in the context of the show, the number of times people have tried to get the jump on him and him being betrayed. But he keeps trusting people that are super shady that try and take him out. At a certain point in time, it's 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 either lazy writing or he's just a not a very interesting character. And I think they need to 
stop using this little trick of like Mando's very trusting of shady people. So anyway, that's number one. Second one is, so he falls in and then he's, he's not looking good. Looks like they caught him. And then jetpack people fly in, rocketeers fly in, start battling everybody, taking out these pirate people that tried to kidnap him and rescue him. So before we start diving into that, the other question that this raises back from the cantina place is, so pirate people, did they know that there were Mandalorians out there and they really were taking them towards them? Or was this all just a ruse? And coincidentally, there happened to be Mandalorians there. There's a little bit of an interesting, I don't know if I missed some line of dialogue in there, but it seemed a little bit like these guys took him off to steal his stuff and without thinking about the fact that there's Mandalorians out there or did they know there were Mandalorians out there? Not quite sure. Anyway, there are Mandalorians out there. Take everybody out. And this is what I got a little bit betrayed by the captions on the TV since uh, I can't hear very well and I have screaming kids in my home. So I always watch stuff with the, the captions on. And it said on the screen, Bo-Katan, about 30 seconds before she actually said that it is Bo-Katan. And we, we'd we known Kitty Sackloff had been cast for the season. She voiced Bo-Katan on Clone Wars, on Rebels. So... It's pretty clear that's where this was headed. Like, you know, sometimes they do a little bit of twists and turns with their casting. Pretty sure we knew that where that was headed, but it was just a question of when was she going to show up? This was the episode where she did show up and true to what she did before, takes her helmet off and Mando is not having this. And I think it was a, a very good thing that they did this because it's one of the big questions of the show. From the very beginning, they've made it so very clear. He does not take his helmet off. It's like this main plot line of season one. And even when he finally does reveal it, it's a huge deal. But we're 40 years into the existence of Mandalorians. And many of them over the last 15 years or over the last 20 years have taken their helmets off. And so we've seen them do that a lot. And he shows up out of nowhere with this TV show a year ago literally, I guess, a year ago to yesterday, and he's taking it, he won't take his helmet off. And so there's, a, there's a, obviously a tension there, and Star Wars has retconned some things before, but this seemed like a pretty big gap for them to just ignore it, especially if you're going to start bringing in those characters that did take their helmets off. So right off the bat, it takes the helmet right off, and we have this kind of dialogue back and forth about the nature of true Mandalorians from Mandalore, as in the people of the planet and people of the creed. And you realize like he's this group of re religious zealots. Children of the watch are a cult of religious zealots that broke away from Mandalorian society. That believe in old school Mandalorian lore. They're actual, actually from Mandalore. And he's like, you guys. And he actually takes off and leaves. So he trusted sketchy pirates because they might take him to Mandalorians, but people in Mandalorian armor take their helmets off and he's like, I'm out of here. Jetpacks out, leaves him behind for a little bit and they have to, to win his trust back over. Wasn't going back to that. I don't think I fully understand M Mando's trust system for who he decides to align with. But so pause a little bit on this Bo-Katan. This is the stuff that I think where this show really kind of fleshes out the Star Wars universe and ties certain things together in a way that's very satisfying for fans. There's a lot of deep Easter eggs. There's a lot of um, calls to classic events that we see in a way that makes the universe feel fleshed out. We're not in the Skywalker saga. Mando's not a Jedi. There's no, no, he doesn't have a lightsaber or anything like that. But he's living in a universe where all that stuff did happen, where all of these TV shows, all these movies have already taken place. And so he would come across these people. He would hear about these massive events involving the government of the entire galaxy. And so the idea that he'd be looking for Mandalorians that he would find... Mandalorians that we saw before would make a lot of sense that those would be the people that he would come in contact with. And when you have someone like Bo-Katan that was so prominent in a bunch of arcs in Clone Wars, showed up in Rebels, we know she's out there, we know she's doing stuff. And so we want to see more of that. And it's a great little touch that 
I don't know if it's just pure luck that they happen to cast a legit actress that has strong nerd cred to voice her back eight years ago, whenever she first showed up on Clone Wars, but they did. And so it's really satisfying when you have someone like that, you know, Starbuck, so many other credits, and then she's able to show up actually as the live action version of that character. That's really cool. That, that's cool when that sort of thing can happen. And like, I don't, in the one sense, I know that being live action doesn't give something more credibility instantly, but there is something about seeing the character as a human and not as a drawing. There, There is something to it. Technically speaking, of course, all of that is legit canon, absolutely. But when you see it, a real person there, and especially when they happen to be voiced by the same person, it's just pretty cool. It's pretty cool when something like that is able to happen. And so... Um, a really nice touch that they were able to do there and just fleshes out so much of the mythology as we'll get into later on this episode. So anyway, this is when kind of the the side mission of our episode kicks in. He wants her to say where he can find a Jedi. She wants to get weapons so she can reclaim Mandalore. Once again, that deep mythology that all the these events that we saw take place uh, throughout all these animated shows of all the civil wars taking place on Mandalore, and then it ties in here. Why is she here? She wants guns, and anyone that can help her get guns so that she can go and reclaim the throne, that's what she wants. So that's what ends up happening, and of course, it happens to be Imperials on it, so always a cool little touch when you see these this remnant of Imperials out there. So you get a bunch of very Star Wars-y imagery of them taking over this ship, the corridors, stormtroopers blasting down the halls. It's always great to see that in Star Wars content. Then you discover the person that is in charge of this ship is played by Titus Welliver. Um, who, this one of the actors has been around forever. He's on Bosch on Amazon Prime and a bazillion other things. So I didn't know that he'd been cast in the season or I'd forgotten that. So seeing him pop up just a nice little touch. And I, I've said this many times. I just love how they cast this show. That the sorts of like random kind of actors and personalities that show up, it's like they're targeting tar targeting me to make put a big grin on my face as they're they're not the obvious A-list type people. No, but they're you know, you're getting Carl Weathers, Apollo Creed showing up in Star Wars or crush from American Gladiators from 12 years ago showing up in Star Wars. Those are things that for me are awesome and it keeps doing that. Titus being another example of that. Even if he is kind of this character that only shows up. My autofocus was doing something weird. So wanted to make sure that you could see my face in full crispness. So they go on the ship, start taking it over and it's a nice little sequence. It has a sets up several clever little ideas as you have this Imperial that's kind of in charge of a group of stormtroopers that gets a fray, goes into a cargo bay and locks them in a section to trap them, but he locks them inside of the section with the controls for the cargo bay. So it just blows them. They blow our Mandos blow them just out of the ship. Nice little bit, nice little gag. And then the plot of the, what's really going on and how it ties into everything grander. What is this doing? starts to come into play and they get the weapons, but then Bo-Katan's like, no, I, I need the whole ship because I want to talk to that guy about finding the real weapon that'll help me secure this whole deal. That's where you start going, oh, I know where this is headed. I know what she wants. I know why she wants it, where this is going. And some her plot lines in the past, in on Rebels, involved the Darksaber. So the big question at the end of chapter eight, when suddenly Blade sticks out of this TIE fighter deal, Gideon walks out with the dark sabers. How did he get it? Cause he's not the person that we last saw that with. And so this episode starts tying the pieces together. She wants the dark saber as part of her plan to retake Mandalore. Mando's a little bit like, Hey, you know, um, that's not what we signed up for. And she's like, well, this is the way I'll, I'm still going to help you, but we got to take this ship. And so then this is where Titus gets on his comm, calls up the chicken man, 
Gideon, Moff Gideon, and starts talking and Gideon's like, all right, she's claimed too much of the ship. You just got to take the whole deal down. And so then Titus blasts these guys in the head, starts crashing the ship. So then they have to go, or Mandos have to go on this crash course run to try to get, save the ship at the last second. They get to the cockpit after Mando does this deal where he runs and throws bombs after taking a bunch of, bunch of hits. They get in there and bo like trying to get information out of the guy. He takes his suicide electric tablet, kills himself. So you won't, might not kill me, but he will. So gets killed, falls down. They claim the ship, but they didn't get the information that she wanted. And then, so he's fulfilled his part of the bargain. Therefore, Bo-Katan fulfills her part of the bargain, says, here's the planet you need to go to if you want to find these Jedi people. There you'll find Ahsoka Tano and says the name. Like we'd heard this was coming. It was out there. Information that we had that that is where this, like within the rumor mill from three, four months back that was found that out, Rosario Dawson. And then it's said once again, once again, obviously all those shows are canon. Being live action doesn't give you more credibility. As soon as you hear that name, though, and it's and you, you hear a see a human face actually say that there is something about that that just gives it a little bit more weight. And then I guess next week, hopefully, when we get there or maybe it'll maybe he'll go on a little bit of a long quest and he'll pull in his previous companions to go on this journey with him to whatever it's going to be. Whenever you see an actual human walk out as a Sokotano, it's, it's just there's something about that. It. It's powerful stuff when you see things like that. So they send them off to on their dark saber quest. He heads off on his ship that's barely repaired, still in really, really bad shape. And they head on out to try and continue his quest to find a Jedi to discover who this little creature is. So that was our episode. And um, like I said, I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. I enjoyed it. This is what I like about the show when they are like this. There's a couple frustrations here and there. Why is Mando so dumb? And a couple couple little nitpicks like that that it just needs to be a little bit smarter. Episode felt a little bit short. Actually, I mean, it's the shortest episode of the season this far. It's only 35 minutes. And so when you have an episode where you get to a planet and he gets taken by pirates, he has to be rescued. We're... In, we're introduced to classic characters inside of this canon and their quests sort of intersect. They go on a mission. That's, there's no reason for it to be 35 minutes. You can stretch it out a little bit. In fact, episode number one of the season was like 20 minutes longer than this. And I think that's one reason people responded well to it because they, they just fleshed things out a little bit more. You could spend a little bit more time absorbing it. And this one, it felt like they just kind of they hit all the beats you wanted, but you kind of wish you could have gotten a little bit more depth. Even, you know, episode or chapter nine, they did flashbacks and they saw certain events that were told in the aftermath book from, but we see it from his perspective. And it's just pretty cool stuff to, to see that. And in this one, you kind of wonder like, wouldn't it have been cool if we got some flashbacks perhaps of events from Clone Wars, of events from Rebels, just these little images that kind of flesh out some of that stuff just a little bit more. I, you know, I don't, it's a 35, like at 35 minutes, that is short for a show like this. So just wish they could have fleshed it out just a little bit. Otherwise, just um, what I love about the show. Those are my thoughts for what I think is going to happen in the next couple episodes. I would guess next week, I, I don't think they're going to go straight to Ahsoka Tano. They tend to like to stretch things out. They take their time getting places. So I'm guessing next week is where we're going to see the shot that we saw in the trailers with Cara Dune, Carl Weathers. He teams back up with them to go on the quest to find Ahsoka Tano. And so it'll be like a, one more episode because they just always have that little piece in the middle between where between A and B. There's always the middle thing that happens. So I'm guessing that's going to happen. And then I'm thinking when we find Ahsoka Tano, we're going to have Rex in the mix. I, there's people who, Rex would be 80 years old. Sure, sure, right. And like, he'd be 80, he'd be dead, right. But we also saw Boba Fett die. We watched a creature eat Boba Fett. 
literally 40 years ago, and then he showed back up and his armor was right there. We saw it happen. Can Rex overcome some programming that makes him age and the fact that he's old? I think that's a little bit easier to do than surviving dying. If Boba Fett can survive dying, Rex can survive living. And they've said it, like the people that are in charge of the can have said the shot from Return of the Jedi on the Battle of Endor, the guy that looks like Rex from the Rebels, they have said, yeah, 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 we'll say that. We'll claim that. That is him. And so he was alive at the Battle of Endor that our time, five years, his sped up timing, it's more years than that. But... It's certainly possible that he's there and we'll see him. I think that of the way that they're doing this season and having a lot of these ties to things, I think that we're going to see Rex right there with Ahsoka. I'm not thinking next episode, two episodes down the line is my guess, my prediction. From with that said, uh, let's go into how I feel about the season as a whole, how this kind of episode fits into my frustrations kind of with the previous two and the, the difference between all of that. And so with this show, as everyone has discussed this, talked about the show, it tends to be very episodic that a conflict is introduced at the beginning of an episode that's resolved by the end of it. Some of those standalone stories tie heavily into the main narrative where you can see exactly how this has connective tissue to characters or the quest with this Baby Yoda journey that they're on. In other episodes, it really doesn't. A whole episode goes by that we learn, hey, what did they do that week? But you don't really see much t connection to anything else that kind of happened. So chapter five, the gunslinger from season one goes to Tatooine and teams up with this new bounty hunter. And they just kind of go on this side quest uh, very much like a Western, some nice Star Wars Easter eggs because we're on Tatooine. But beyond that, it just doesn't tie into anything. It's just this little side quest that he goes on. So a lot of people didn't like that episode very much. Likewise, a lot of us were frustrated with last week's episode because chapter nine ends with this Boba Fett tease. And then the episode kicks off with him going, another person happens to know where a Mandalorian might be if... He plays Taxi, and so he plays Taxi, but it, it felt a little bit like you, know, you could skip over that episode. You could have, in that one scene, in that intro scene to the episode, the, they could have said, go to this planet, there's Mandalorians there, and you could have skipped out over all of last week's episode, and the only th question that would have been would be like, um, why did the ship get damaged? Like, that was the only thing that really kind of tied into it. But, you know, this whole quest about rebels showing up, Baby Yoda eating eggs and being hungry. Like it just, it was inconsequential to anything. It didn't feel like we learned anything. Didn't feel like we met anyone that was terribly important. It was just this little thing that happened between getting from A to B. Just a pit stop along the way. So when you get to this episode, it like... It is a side quest in the sense that the main conflict of the episode is him helping someone else on their little journey. But all kinds of details of it, it ties to the grander Star Wars universe. This person that he meets clearly is on a quest that lines up with Mandos. They don't know it at the moment. We have information that they don't have because we saw Darksaber at the end of last season. Mando didn't see that. And so... Because of that, we can fill in details that they can't, but Mando's being chased by the person that, sh that Bo-Katan is trying to track down. So all of this is, of course, going to tie back together later in the season. So you start to put the picture together of what's going on. Likewise, at the end of it, when the quest, at the end of it, it's not, well, there might be a Mandalorian over there that might be able to help you find something, maybe. When you hear that for... From the end of last season here, there's like a three episode stretch of go there to find some people that might be able to. A lot of question marks there. This one, it's go to this place, Ahsoka Tano. Like I'm telling you where to go. I'm telling you, telling you who you'll find there. And us as Star Wars people hear that and go, oh, oh, OK, now we're getting somewhere. That's the stuff that. The contrast. Does it just feel like you could just throw this episode out and then all it raises the question is, how'd the ship get damaged? Or does it feel like it's tying things together? Or does it feel like it's a compelling little story? 
Mando teaming up with Mandalorians to raid an Imperial ship is a lot more interesting to me than Mando playing taxi, crashes his taxi and has to repair the outside before bugs eat him. It's just not quite as interesting. Like it's just like fish person he can't really communicate with while baby Yoda's trying to eat eggs. Okay. I didn't hate it, but it just of all the things you could do, that's a weird plot line to fill up one eighth or 13, 14% of the runtime of your season. So that's that contrast. Some people like, well, it's always like so the conversation I had all last week was, well, it's always been an episodic show. Why are people frustrated that it's episodic? Like, well, it's not that it's epi- when episodes are episodic. It's when they're inconsequential, when it doesn't add anything, when I don't learn anything new. I don't feel like I met someone that's really going to matter or I didn't meet someone old that's really interesting to see how it ties to the whole universe. Like, I, I have to have something that feels like it's progressing where we're headed, meeting someone I care about or something happening that's interesting. Taxi's not interesting to me. Raids and stuff are a lot more interesting, especially with fun people like Bo-Katan. So anyway, all that to say, I'm glad that we finally got the episode that let us see where all of this is headed, how it's going to kind of tie together. He met met more allies that I'm sure are going to show up later on in some big, massive, epic showdown that I'm very excited to see. So uh, solid, solid episode. I'd have to rewatch chapter nine to know which one I prefer over the other. I'm not, I'm not quite sure that each of them have some really fun ties to star Wars lore. This one, I think had the stuff that I needed for the season to make the season a little bit better as just standalone episodes. I'm not, I'm not really entirely sure which one I would put on top. Rewatchings will help me flesh that out and decide that. But um, yeah, so very excited to see next week. I hope once it will get two in a row that kind of progress things, so we do that get that Ahsoka Tano. If it feels like, oh, we're about to meet Ahsoka Tano, and then it's like side quest over here, side mission, and you know, Cara Dune shows back up, and then they they do some side thing before we go. It just feels like they're stretching it out and delaying. I hope that they don't go in that direction. I hope we get where we're going so we just can feel that progress and that momentum. And you just get a lot more excitement about where things are headed when that happens, and you feel energy about it, momentum urgency as opposed to when it just feels like big pauses after you just teased something awesome we'll see what happens next week i'm excited tell me what you thought down below also if you don't know i've been doing a bunch of reviews i've been doing reviews actually with my son as well over my second channel you can check that out or those out right over there thank you so much for watching and keep talking movies and star wars too much